You know, one of the great things about working at the Washington Post, where I was for 30 years um, before becoming a bookseller, uh, is that you get to meet a lot of extraordinary people. But Steve really was among the most extraordinary. He spent 20 years at the Post, including time as a financial reporter, a foreign correspondent, head of the uh, Sunday magazine, and for six years, managing editor of the, of the whole paper. And I remember that we, we all marveled at his talents. He always seemed gifted at expressing himself, whether in writing or in speech. But it wasn't only the clarity and ele elegance of his prose. It was also the thought behind it. He's one of those people who's adept at perceiving the big picture, the grand narrative of something, while at the same time digging deep and wide into all relevant facts and details. Few things in journalism seem to give Steve more of a charge than a penetrating investigative article. And he never seems to sleep. Uh, we couldn't believe, for instance, how he was able to write Ghost Wars, his Pulitzer Prize winning account of the CIA's history in Afghanistan, while also running the Post as managing editor. And that was his, his second Pulitzer Prize, the, uh, Pulitzer, uh, Prize, by the way. 15 years earlier in, 19, in 1990, he won for explanatory journalism for a series with David Weiss about the SEC's battle with Wall Street. Steve left the Post several years ago and became president of the New America Foundation, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research institute in Washington. But he hasn't left journalism. He, he also uh, holds the, the title of staff writer for the New Yorker magazine. And he still somehow, evidently, uh, has spare time. Uh, which he uses to write books, big, impressive, revealing ones, like his latest, Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power. Uh, now here's what uh, one review of Private Empire in the Daily Beast, uh, here, here's how that review began. You cannot hide from Steve Call. Better men than you have tried. The world's most elusive, powerful networks have failed. Indeed, whether it's the CIA's previously secret doings in Afghanistan before 9-11 or the untold stories of the Bin Laden, Bin Laden clan, Steve was able to bring to light what others had not and to weave the information into fascinating and compelling books. And he's, uh, he's done it again uh, with ExxonMobil, which he found to be an even harder tar target than either the CIA or the Bin Ladens. For one thing, the company is not only highly se secretive, but purposefully intimidating. For another, it's, it's enormous, the largest publicly traded company by market capitalization. Steve describes ExxonMobil as a corporate state within the American state. And what he's documented with exhaustive research is how that corporate power has been exercised across the globe in myriad ways whether it's having its way in failed states or getting entangled in small wars or disputing global warming or employing lobbyists to shape foreign policy and bend regulations or withholding cooperation from Congress. A number of reviewers of Private e Empire have noted that for all its exposure of ExxonMobil's machinations, the book remains remarkably fair and even-handed. This is no anti-corporate screed. It is rather a meticulous, authoritative, and engrossing account of both the bad and the good that a giant company like ExxonMobil engenders. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Steve Call. Uh, thank you, Brad. That was great. And, and thank you for all your help and, and support over the years. It's great to see some friends here from the Post, uh, Kevin Merritt and Donna Britt, whose uh, work you've probably read a lot more than mine. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't have a lot of time together, so I'll try to use it efficiently. I also have this coat that I don't know what to do with. So put it here. Um, but I did want to just digress for a second and say as I was driving up here, I was reminded how much of a hometown appearance this is because this is, uh, I lived in Montgomery Village for a while when I first started at the Post a long time ago. And uh, this is this, I think my seventh, seventh book. And the second one was also about oil. And I wrote it in an office on East Deer Park Drive, just down there. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the place, drove right by it. Uh, anyway, I went to Wooten. I worked at the Washingtonian Country Club when it existed. 
And uh, I turned on, off the Sam Ig Highway as I came here. And in those days, Sam Ig was still alive, and I served him gefilte fish at the buffet line as a uh, <laughs> buffet man. So anyway, uh, some things are still the same, and some things are different. So. Uh, just to give you a taste of this very large book, and let me just frame it for a second and explain what I was interested in doing. I wanted to write about oil in an age of limits and, and American power and an age of constraint. The Prize by Dan Jurgen, some of you might have read, was a book that inspired me as a young journalist. It was always on my shelf as a sort of someday I will write a book like that uh, sort of role. And when I finished the last book about Saudi Arabia, I really wanted to write about oil. but. I thought, the pro I thought of the prize as a narrative about oil and American power in the age of discovery and expansion, and I wanted to write a similar narrative about oil and American power in an age of limits and, and, and struggle, really. And I actually started out that way, and I got about six months into the project and decided I really needed a tighter focus, so I chose ExxonMobil as the largest corporation headquartered in the United States. And as I made that turn, the book itself changed shape and became as much as anything else, a case study about the character and power of multinationals in the world we inhabit, especially the post-Cold War world. It opens with the Valdez wreck and comes forward to the present day. And so it's a, an account of ExxonMobil's um, sort of place in the world in Washington and abroad over those 20 years. And so just to give you a little feel for both the particulars and some of the themes, I'll start where the book begins, which is on the night of uh, March 23, 1989, in a port uh, of Valdez in Prince William Sound. Have any of you ever been to Prince William Sound? I urge you to go. I, I went there on uh, research for this book. I was stunned that such a place exists in the United States. Pristine uh, wildlife refuge, an inland sea teeming with whales and sea lions and otters and seals, uh, bald eagles, uh, enormous schools of migratory salmon and, and halibut. And it is also the terminus for the export of North Slope oil that was discovered and developed uh, by a series of oil companies led by BP in the 1950s. And by the time of March 23, 1989, the oil was pouring down this pipeline and being loaded by a rotating school of tankers to bring it out to open markets and the, and the ocean. And the Valdez that night was uh, captained by a, a man named Joseph Hazelwood, who some of you, uh, whose name maybe some of you may remember. And he had been at Exxon for a long time and uh, had uh, developed, he had a very distinguished career for a tanker captain. He had gone to the elite Maritime Academy in New York. He'd once scored, I think, 138 on an IQ test. He quoted Stonewall Jackson and uh, Oscar Wilde on, uh, in his cabin aboard ship. And he was um, having what he later called a midlife crisis by that evening. He had taken to drinking about five or six doubles before dinner, then wine with dinner, then uh, more afterwards. And yet he described himself as not really much affected by that level of uh, alcohol intake, able to maneuver around and do his business. He had been arrested a couple of times for driving under the influence and had his license suspended, yet Exxon had let him continue to, to uh, run the, this enormous tanker with, that night, more than a million gallons, I mean a million barrels of oil aboard as it pulled out of the Valdez Harbor and headed to the open sea. Now, he had spent the evening at the Pipeline Club in Valdez and had a few vodkas and then came aboard at around 9 o'clock. And off they went outbound. Now, there were so many tankers coming in and out of this wildlife uh, refuge, in effect, that they, had, they just developed a highway system. You essentially went on the right in a 10-mile uh, sea lane. And uh, that evening, as they got out into the, toward the open sea, Hazelwood could see icebergs bobbing uh, in this outbound lane ahead from the Columbia Glacier. And that was not unusual in March. They showed up visually and also on his radar. And there was a common maneuver, which was to basically turn left, cross into the inbound lane, straighten out, pass the iceberg, and then get back into your lane. And they radioed the Coast Guard for permission to do this, and permission was granted. And Hazelwood said to his mate, I have some paperwork to do below in my cabin. Do you mind handling this? They'd done it 20 or 30 times before. Do you feel like you can handle this? And the mate said, yeah, I can do this. So Hazelwood actually went below. This was not in keeping with Exxon rules, but he did so. And the 
the mate uh, proceeded to execute this maneuver. And what happened in the next 20 or 30 minutes is not actually at all well known. What, what can be said is that there was a sort of confusion and disorientation that developed on the bridge of the ship. And after about 20 or 30 minutes, uh, they lost track of where they were, the way a pilot might in bad weather or fog. And the next thing that happened was this enormous shuddering sound as the ship ran aground on, on Bly Reef. And then the sound of oil bubbling into the sea and the smell of that oil rising. And uh, the first mate ran down to Hazelwood's uh, cabin and pounded on the door and shout, shout, shouted out, uh, vessel aground, we are effed, I will say here before this polite audience. When Hazelwood recalled that he came out of his cabin, uh, ran upstairs, uh, ran into a bathroom, uh, purged himself, and, and then thought to himself that the world that he had known had, had just come to an end. Uh, and that was true for Exxon Corporation as well. And that's the sort of trauma for this corporate state that explains quite a lot of what they became and what they are today. Not all of it, but a substantial part of the narrative begins with this crisis. Now, more than 200,000 barrels poured into the Prince William Sound, and it was particularly damaging because of the wildlife that lived there. A lot of surface mammals came in contact with the oil in the first days, preened themselves, ingested it, and died. Television cameras uh, arrived, still the era of network news, high impact visual news, disaster news, and thousands of uh, sea otters and seals galvanized public opinion about the outrage that this accident represented, uh, both to the environment and to, um, to the economy, because it wiped out fisheries and fishermen uh, overnight. Now, the drunk driving metaphor was very appealing. And if you go back and look, as I did at the David Letterman show, there's quite a lot of uh, pretty good jokes about Hazelwood wanting to uh, chip some ice off the iceberg for his margarita and that sort of thing. But as the story I've, I've briefly summarized suggests, it's actually inadequate to explain what happened. Uh, Hazelwood's uh, drinking may not have been a factor in the accident at all, actually, other than perhaps as a motivation for him leaving the bridge. But what became clear more slowly and never acquired the same amount of attention was that this was a catastrophic failure of corporate risk management and government oversight. In the 10 years before this wreck, Exxon had cut its workforce from 182,000 to 100,000, 82,000 jobs in 10 years to try to cope with volatile and then ultimately declining oil prices. The Coast Guard in the Reagan era had also cut uh, its capacity to oversee shipping in the, in the Prince William Sound to the point where the Coast Guard unit on shore that was contacted by the Valdez didn't even have radar to see its position. So it, it could never tell that it had gotten disoriented and, and headed out of the inbound lanes. And I, I emphasize this because this is really where we still are today in an industry that in the scale of its daily operations is being driven increasingly into riskier and risky, riskier environments, but which is not adequately overseen uh, by, certainly by the federal government and, and state and, and local governments are often not even in the game. Now, the Valdez wreck galvanized reform inside Exxon and the reform was led by a man who looms large in this uh, story, a guy named Lee Raymond, who was the chief executive of, of Exxon from 1993 until 2005. Um, if you look at the numbers of his performance, he was the most successful oil executive of his era. He was a larger than life uh, character. He'd grown up in the Midwest and South Dakota. His father was a railroad engineer. And he had a very formidable appearance. He'd become a sort of a fleshy man in midlife and he had um, a very uh, large face, big ears, and a billowing neck, sort of like a, a bullfrogs. And he'd had a uh, cleft lip as a child, which had left, uh, cleft palate as a child, left him with a hair lip. And his intimidating sort of manner was often attributed by his colleagues to you know, sort of amateur psychology of what it would have been like to grow up, um, you know, with these 
with his, with his physical appearance on a playground in, in the sort of unforgiving Midwest. And in any event, he was the most direct, blunt, uh, difficult leader that I've ever heard described in corporate leadership. Very effective, but uh, really ready to take his colleague's head off at, at a meeting uh, like this. He, was, he, was, he could be quite kind and charming in small groups, and, and uh, he, was, he was very sentimental about Exxon and its employees. But he also felt as if he needed to go looking for a fight any time he was in a management setting. And uh, he, it would be typical for him to call out someone who asked a question he didn't approve of as, as a, again, I, we're here in prime time radio, I'm going to interpret my language restrictions that way, but as a, as a, a, a stupid jerk, let's say, uh, in front of an, an audience of this size. Uh, and there was one, uh, one manager who had worked with him who described a meeting uh, where he had presented a question that Raymond found lacking in foundation. And he'd said, uh, so what little birdie just flew in and whispered that dumb shit idea in your, in your ear? <laughs> Sorry, I just violated my own rule. Um, <laughs> that's, what, that's what Lee Raymond will do to you. Um, but he was uh, determined to use, he was a very forceful and effective leader, even if sometimes a difficult man to work for. And he was determined to use the Valdez crisis to remake Exxon, and, and in a strategic sense, his goal was to wring human fallibility out of all of their daily industrial operations to the greatest possible degree that engineering could achieve. And his objective was to uh, do this by creating automated, idiot-proof systems that could be expressed in a series of manuals that every employee of Exxon on every day in every office around the world would follow and know exactly what to do, whether it involved requisitioning a stapler or uh, conducting maintenance on a refinery or uh, operating an oil tanker with a million barrels on board. This became known as the Operations Integrity Management System, and one of its, uh, or OIMS, and one of its focuses was worker safety. Never again was the motto. It was that sort of a crisis, never again. And so they developed this almost a uh, Soviet system of collectives of worker confessionals and sort of group um, support to try to reduce days lost to injury to as near to zero as possible. And that meant that every meeting at Exxon, even if it was the same group of folks who worked together every day for months at a time, every meeting had to start with a safety minute. And if we, if we were there today, I, I would have started by pointing to the exits and noting that if you uh, if an emergency arises, that the way out to the street is behind you. And some of the former managers I talked to said that their greatest source of anxiety at Exxon was the fact that they had to keep giving these safety minutes to the same four or five people for months at a time, and they ran out of anything original to say. So when they knew it was their day driving into work, they'd spend an hour fretting over something that would make everyone safe. But the culture extended beyond the workplace. There were 12-step style confessional meetings at which workers would talk to each other about near misses they'd had, not only uh, on the refinery floor, but at home. So people would talk about going on vacation and getting too much sunburn and how they might have lost half a day of work if they hadn't uh, used uh, enough sunscreen. Or someone operated a lawnmower improperly and a rock came out and struck them in the leg. Or someone uh, hurt themselves with a snow shovel. And so this culture actually gradually produced the best operating record in the business and made ExxonMobil more and more formidable. By last year, this uh, corporate state within a state was uh, making more than $450 billion in revenue. That's more than the economic activity of most countries in the world. It's about the same size as the economy of Norway. They were operating in 180 different countries, and they um, had political operations, security operations, their own foreign policy, and their own uh, independent uh, security policies. Some of the people I, I talked to who had worked in the U.S. government said their system of classification was um, more, was tighter and, and more locked down than that of the U.S. government. Now, it would take a long time to even dip in and out of some of the narrative threads. This book is set in Chad and Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria and in their office on K Street in Washington, D.C., where they lobby and at their corporate headquarters in Irving, Texas, and in Aceh, where they ended up inheriting a small war from Indonesia, uh, from Mobile and had to, to uh, fight it with Indonesian uh, security services. 
But I want to give you a sense of why that scene at uh, the Valdez uh, still resonates and what the world really looks like to ExxonMobil, notwithstanding its enormous size um, and influence in, in capitals all around the world. Essentially, this tight operating culture that Raymond built after the Valdez, this rule-bound, manual-driven, automated system, had to confront year after year a business that drove ExxonMobil inexorably into higher and higher risk environments. And the reason was that back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, if you were a giant oil company, you never really even had to count up how much oil and gas in the world you owned because you had access to the big pools of safe, politically stable oil in the Middle East. Exxon owned a piece of Saudi Arabia's oil. It owned a piece of Iraq's oil. It owned a piece of Iran's oil. But after the 70s, resource nationalism expropriated all of these holdings by foreign corporations, and it drove the Western corporations into weak and unstable countries, because that was the only place left where the governments couldn't own the oil themselves, couldn't develop this nationalistic approach. So ExxonMobil is disproportionately today uh, in West Africa. 25 percent of its oil and liquids production is out of uh, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Nigeria, and Angola. When I was traveling in Chad to research this book, I, I originally it was fairly early on, I thought, why is Exxon here? But the answer is they're so desperate to replace the reserves they produce each year, they have no choice but to go to all the countries that will have them. And that has, in, has increasingly driven them towards political risk and into these weak and unstable states. And equally, they've been driven towards environmental risk. Because in order to compete with the rising state-owned oil companies of, of Russia and China and India, they have to demonstrate that they have a technological edge that none of these state-owned companies can possess. And so they're driven to deep water frontiers, they're driven to uh, the Arctic Circle, and they're constantly operating in conditions that have never been tested before by an oil company. And so uh, this tension in the narrative, almost like a novel where the protagonist has a dilemma that they can't resolve, the tension is between the world's tightest operating culture, the most conservative safety culture, and a business model that is driving them towards greater and greater risk. It's sort of like the aviation industry in the 1930s. It took us a long time to figure out how not to routinely crash planes in bad weather or in uh, difficult conditions. And we're still in the early ages of that, of that age of oil. So I want to leave some time uh, for questions. And I'm sorry to rush through uh, a, what you'll discover is a, not a small book, but I would think a, a, very, a book full of momentum and excitement. Uh, <laughs> So um, thank you for listening, and let me, let me take some questions. I can deliver some of the other material in response to subject. A anything is, um, yes, ma'am. Could, Could you stand up, sir? Sorry. Sir, can hear Right. Right. What is Exxon doing to ensure its dominance in the future? Great question. So, um, I described how they've been driven out of the safe oil, and they face all these constraints on them. And another one uh, would be uh, the rise of global warming as a as a scientific uh, as a source of scientific consensus and as a source of public policy threat to them, and. Uh, so they, they have invested heavily in trying to prevent a price on oil and gas from being imposed by funding groups that have done quite a lot to pollute public understanding about climate science. And that's an indication of the sort of long-term um, investments that they make around public policy that affects their business model. Their vision of the future is one in which they, they have a high degree of confidence that oil and gas will remain primary. Uh, oil and natural gas. Uh, Lee Raymond used to tell his colleagues that he wanted to emblazon on the granite at the front of their headquarters the words crude oil. So everyone coming to work every day would be in no confusion about what business they're in. Even today, they still see themselves as oil and gas purists. They, don't, they, they have a deeply resourced science department that studies alternative energy technologies every year. And they're looking at them to see if a breakthrough could threaten the basic assumptions of their business model.
Now, they do this privately, in secret, and I worked hard to try to figure out what they think. My impression is that there's only one technology that makes them a bit nervous. That's battery technology. If you had a real breakthrough in battery storage capacity, then oil as a source of transportation fuel might be threatened not only in the United States but globally. Um, but there's a lot of ifs associated with breakthroughs uh, in battery storage capacity, including the sustainability of a global production system on the scale of the oil industry. Uh, basically, there's only one other decision about the next 40 or 50 years that they're making, and that is primarily because oil is hard for them to access for the reasons that I described, that they've been locked out of owning oil in most of the world because of nationalism, not just in the Middle East, but in lots of post-colonial societies. Governments are not prepared to let ExxonMobil own their oil and gas. So they have been shifting uh, toward natural gas because if you can't own oil in a lot of countries, the one attraction of the free market West is that property rights are sacrosanct. If you can find it, you can own it. The problem is that until recently, there hasn't been much oil and gas in the United States or in the, uh, Europe or, or Australia. Um, and so with the boom of this unconventional gas technology that you've probably heard about, the fracking technique, it creates a huge opportunity for them to move onshore into the free market United States. And they're doing so. They, they bought the country's largest producer of unconventional natural gas extracted by these so-called fracking techniques. So when you hear of fracking now, uh, like all the big oil companies, they missed this whole thing uh, when it emerged. But like they always have the capacity to do, they bought their way in. Uh, and they purchased this large company, XTO, in 2010. So when you hear about fracking today, ExxonMobil is, in fact, the largest uh, producer of uh, that kind of gas in the country. One more question, and then we'll let the next person come up. Yes. <laughs> Why did the government allow Exxon to merge with Mobil? Uh, you know, what's interesting about the power of multinationals, and Exxon is the most powerful multinational that we have, 450 billion, uh, number one on the Fortune 500 list last year by revenue. Apple's a little bigger in stock market cap at the moment. But not, the top five uh, companies in the United States on the Fortune 500 list are all oil companies. Exxon number one, she, uh, Chevron I think is three, and Conoco is in the five. I don't remember the exact order. But Exxon's revenue is twice again as large as Chevron, if you want a, a sense of the scale of this company. And Chevron's number three in the entire country. Now, why isn't that an antitrust issue, you're asking? It's because our antitrust laws concentrate on market power inside the United States. And they have systematically divested themselves of certain kinds of downstream fueling station, refinery assets that would get them into trouble with American antitrust. They needed to get big in order to compete on the global stage. That's the story of our time. In fact, if you put them up against the state-owned companies in Russia or China, they're not the biggest anymore. So they argued successfully they needed to get huge in the United States in order to compete in the era of globalization. And our kind of attitude about global markets these days and, and our attitude about corporations has uh, allowed that to go forward. One last uh, fact. Corporate uh, income in the United States today in comparison to household income or small business income is greater than at any time since the Gilded Age. And ExxonMobil is the largest corporation of that type. Its, its profits alone in a good year you know, are near 40, probably this year be near $40 billion. So if you, we have a lot of conversations in this country about inequality and the 1%, and we think about Wall Street and individuals, hedge fund traders, but we have these enormous institutions in our midst that are not scrutinized. I worked on this project for four years. I looked in my rearview mirrors. I didn't see anybody else out there. You know, I had spent my whole career working on government institutions. And there are 15 or 20 corporations of, of similar influence in our own system that, that rarely uh, receive this kind of scrutiny. Anyway, I'm, I'm running over time, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much for your attention.